Good afternoon. Welcome to the Holocaust Center for Humanities Lunch and Learn series on Zoom. My name is Julia Thompson, and I am the Education Program Manager at the Holocaust Center. A live transcript for this program is available on Zoom. Click Live Transcript at the bottom of the screen, and then click Show Subtitle. The Holocaust Center for Humanity in downtown Seattle is open on Sundays, 10 to 4, to the public. We invite you to come and visit our exhibit, Finding Light in the Darkness. And when you visit the Holocaust Center, we ask you to consider the land on which you are standing. The center sits on the traditional land of the Duwamish and Salish peoples. We honor with gratitude the land itself and those who came before us, who stewarded the land and remain leaders and activists within our communities. Thank you today to our 2021 Lunch and Learn series sponsor, the Tacoma Jewish Community Fund. And thank you to today's program partner, Amnesty International Group for Seattle Jewish Family Service. Today's program is the virtual launch of the center's first graphic novel about beloved Holocaust survivor, Steve Adler, titled More Than Any Child Should Know, A Kinder Transport Story of the Holocaust, written by my colleague, Paul Regelbrug and me, and illustrated by Sean Doherty. I'll go, go through some more formalities and introductions, then the main program, and finally, we will leave time for questions. Please add them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If this is your very first Lunch and Learn, we are so pleased to have you here. Drop your name and where you're tuning in from in the chat if this is your first time joining us, and hopefully it won't be the last. If you are a longtime viewer and missed these programs in the past six weeks, so glad you're back. Our next six Lunch and Learns are a series titled Connecting the Holocaust to Today, featuring a variety of voices on important and challenging topics. Our first next week will highlight the work and scholarship of Judy Battalion, author of the book, The Light of Days, the untold story of women resistance fighters in Hitler's ghettos. In other center news, we look forward to hosting our annual Voices for Humanity luncheon on October 21st. We wish we could gather in person, of course, but our second virtual luncheon on Zoom will be the next best thing. Please register by visiting holocaustcenterseattle.org forward slash VFH. Steve Adler was born Stefan Siegfried in Berlin, 1930. His early life was marked by hardship and confusion as Nazi rule took over Germany. By 1935, Jewish kids like Steve and his brother Ralph were affected by the Nuremberg Laws and other restrictions that dictated how and where they could play, learn, and grow. Their parents, Alfred and Ilsa, contended with possible ways to escape their home country as anti-Semitic persecution increased. The Kinder Transport Program, through which England offered nearly 10,000 refugee children safe haven, began in 1938, and Steve was one of the Jewish kids randomly selected for a spot. We'll get into how Steve's story evolved from there throughout the program today, but eventually Steve did end up in the US and after a successful career as a chemist, retired to Seattle in the 1990s. By then, Steve was already an accomplished speaker in the world of Holocaust education, both in Connecticut and nationally. He continued to share his survivor story with thousands in this region as a member of our center's speaker, speakers bureau before he passed away in April, 2019. Steve meant so, so much to this community and made an impact on countless individuals, creating opportunities for students to reflect, learn, and consider how they could make a difference in their own corner of the world. He spoke out about his Holocaust story and other historic and contemporary injustices. A friend of Steve's, a teacher, called him, quote, a giant. In the classroom, he was the truest face of living history, humble and committed. He gave us the feeling that righteousness could be inside us all. Now, let me briefly introduce our three other panelists. Paula Regelbrug is a Holocaust Center's teaching and learning specialist. 
He was an attorney before switching careers to teaching in Chicago, Buffalo, Spokane, and Kent, Washington. Paul has several fellowships from Holocaust institutions around the country, including the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. He's also the author of The Yellow Star House, the remarkable story of one boy's survival in a protected house in Hungary. Sean Doherty is an artist and illustrator based in Seattle, where he lives with his wife, three children, and two cats. When he isn't painting or drawing, Sean can often be found playing with his kids in the park. And Barbara Adler West is a treasured member of our Speakers Bureau and the youngest child of Steve Adler. Barbara retired from a career as an attorney specializing in elder law and just a few short days ago left the Pacific Northwest for a new adventure in Atlanta. Barbara also co-wrote a book with Steve several years ago, When I Need Your Help, I'll Let You Know, and other senior myths that can lead to disaster. More Than Any Child Should Know came to fruition over a period of 18 months, and our first print run will happen today. This graphic novel is aimed at middle and high school students with a glossary, additional resources and reading, and a teacher's guide. The ebook will be free to any educator and available later this month or early October. To all those who already pre-ordered a copy of the book, along with registering for this Lunch and Learn, a huge thank you. You, you will receive it in several weeks. If you are interested to pre-order for our next print run, please simply use the same registration link as for this program, and we will be posting an updated pre-order link on our website. It is with the utmost humility and gratitude that Steve shared his life with us all, and for Paul, Sean, and me, passing on his tremendous and beloved legacy was the first and foremost goal of creating this book, which is dedicated to Steve's memory. Now, let's kick off the main part of our program today with a video clip introducing Steve Adler. I'm Steve Adler. Uh, I was born in Berlin, Germany, 1930. I was um, eight and a half years old when my, uh, my mother and father put me on a train to Hamburg and then on a ship to London. All right, well, we saw a little bit of Steve just now and hello, Barbara, hi, Paul and Sean. Welcome to the panel, to the program. Thank you so much for doing this with me. Um, first, I, I wanna ask you, Barbara, um, who was Steve Adler to you? Tell us about your relationship. Um, <clears throat> my dad was a very complicated man. Um, I think my primary memory of him um, is as someone who was a lot of fun. Um, he was pretty well educated, but he had an enormous capacity to goof around. He liked to write silly words and parody songs. Um, he was a chemist by trade. Uh, he liked crossword puzzles. He loved his grandchildren. He was a survivor um, and an immigrant. And as he grew older, he realized that there were important lessons um, that he had learned young in life. And he saw his life experience repeated over and over and over. Um, and his parents wouldn't speak about the Holocaust. My grandmother lost both of her parents. And she said to me, that door is closed. Um, I don't go there. And it was not a time um, in the post-war years where we were so confessional. Um, and where people were so accepting of the need to talk. But my dad was different. I, I don't know if he felt he had been spared. I always felt that he had been saved for some good reason. Um, and he, um, as the logo says under the Holocaust Center banner, uh, he sought to educate and inspire and take action. Um, and so education, of the lessons of the Holocaust became his passion in life, along with his cat. <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. Um, 
Now, Paul, we want to go to you. And can you talk a little about um, the genesis of this idea that we create a graphic novel? Um, tell us how that came about and um, why it was important for the Holocaust Center to do. Sure. Thanks so much, Julia. And thank you for the, the nice introduction. Um, yeah, so as a teacher, uh, I was always, you know, I taught primarily through English language arts, and um, I taught kids of so many different levels, English language learners, kids uh, significantly below level readers, and also highly capable readers. And so it was always important to me to figure out how best to differentiate, to make sure I was accommodating all learning styles, all reading abilities, and ideally to be able to engage, uh, you know, you know, everyone in the class, right? And so with graphic novels, and especially like Mouse by Art Spiegelman, um, that was really the first one that I had used with students. And I saw it basically be like the be all end all as, a, as an educational tool with students from the most reluctant and or lowest level readers to the kids who literally would tell me, Mr. R, I hate reading. All of a sudden, we would begin with a little bit of context and everything leading into mouse. And once kids saw this combination of the images with the words, it really transformed their sort of approach to reading. Suddenly, words that became difficult, concepts that became difficult, made more sense when coupled with pictures. And so they would get so engaged. I remember this one student, Chris, who used to just tell me, forget it, I, I hate reading. He comp I couldn't get his nose out of the book. I, he just was so pouring over every detail in there. And I would try to say, look, we need to you know, discuss this stuff. He says, I get it all, Mr. R, it's in my head. I understand everything, trust me. And it was just a beautiful thing. And on the other end of the spectrum, some of my higher level readers, this combination of words and images inspired them so much. It gave them so many new possibilities and new ideas for what reading is, what art is. It influenced and inspired many of their own sort of artistic uh, um, um, goals and dreams and things and imagining that I can do this too because I'm better at art or combining things. And I'll, I'll never forget this one student, her name was Trinity. And she told me specifically, she was a strong reader, but she told me, she, she came to me at the end of the year and she said, Mr. R, you know, reading doesn't come easily to me. I know I'm pretty good at it, but because of these pictures with the words, I feel like I understand everything so much better. So from a metacognitive level, this just worked and it resonated. So when I came to the Holocaust Center in short in 2019, um, and we, I think collectively, we saw that the Pittsburgh Holocaust Museum had developed their own series of comics called Chutzpah, which we were really amazed by. And this was so, such a cool concept. We were immediately like, why not? We should do something like that too for some of our survivors. And so I think that, that was the genesis, Julia. And I remember talking with you and with Alana and our eyes all lit up and we're like, let's do this. And the rest is kind of history. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Paul. Well, let's dive straight into some of the artwork that appears in the book. Um, I think we're going to take a look at page nine. And this is the first page that Paul and I wrote collaboratively, um, sort of to mock up what the entire book structure would look like. Um, and it's based on this iconic scene that uh, Steve shared many, many times about his father coming back from a concentration camp um, in late 1938. And um, I think we're gonna get some audio here of Steve describing this as well. Maybe, um, Richard. Do we have the audio of Steve? Let me give this another try here. It didn't, didn't uh, play out here. Let me give it one more try. Not a, not a problem. Okay. 
Okay, well, let's let's move on for now um, and continue speaking about this page, but um, we'll just imagine Steve's voice um, as he remembered this scene, but I think maybe we'll get it in a moment. For now, um, I wanna hear from you, Sean, if you don't mind, um, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, tell us about your artwork process um, using this page as an example. I know that there are some specific challenges you found with page nine. Um, can you share that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Julia. Um, so obviously here in the page, um, we see when Steve's dad came back from the concentration camp or from the, the camp. And uh, it was a very emotional scene. And I was, I have kids about Steve's age. And I was caught by the fact that what Steve really remembered and really popped out in his head was the fact that his dad brought him these chocolate bananas. And so for me, one of the, one of the biggest challenges uh, of this book was finding the, the props and the, the things that would be authentic to Steve's memory and his uh, experiences. Uh, so here you can see his dad has a, a box of these uh, uh, Kasali chocolate bananas. And I had to research that the company was actually made and, and was in existence in Berlin at that time. Um, you know, and then later on, uh, when Steve and his brother retired to their room, um, you can see artwork on the wall uh, from a famous anti-Nazi cartoonist of the time um, called uh, Vatu and Sun, uh, and as well as the toys around the room were time-specific toys. Uh, so I, I spent a lot of time trying to both capture that emotion and the feeling that Steve had um, and what his family must have been going through at that time, but then also trying to make it historically accurate as much as I could. Um, it was a really interesting process. I learned so much about the time period and about the Holocaust. I'm going to give that audio one more shot again. So let's see Thanks. if this works. Thanks, Richard. Kristalna started on the evening of the 9th of November, 38. Um, I went to school in the morning with my brother, uh, but we were immediately sent home. There was a man in our living room with my dad, uh, and uh, he took him away. Uh, he was gone for six weeks. And during that six-week time, I didn't know where he was. He came back on the 23rd of December, 38, six weeks later, uh, beaten up, smelling terribly. Uh, he was a mess, shaved head, you know, no hair on his head. And uh, that, was, that was a good camp. It was Sachsenhausen, north of Berlin, one of three camps operating in Germany. Great, thank you so much, Richard. Um, it's powerful for me to hear Steve's voice describing um, this incident as we also see Sean's depiction of it. Um, so what we're seeing here in the page is Steve's father um, trudging back home after his release from Sachsenhausen concentration camp in the snow, greeting his family again um, with lots of bruises. Whereas in the next panel, the kids, Steve and Ralph are just kind of wondering what's going on, sent to their room um, while their mother, Ilsa, is helping Alfred clean up. So, now I wanna, um, Paul, let's come back to you and talk a little bit about the writing process. Um, you have already written a novel. Uh, you wrote a book about another Holocaust survivor, Robert Holzer, um, which is fantastic. And I'm, I think it might illuminate the process a bit if you could speak to the differences in writing that book and in writing this graphic novel. Sure, you're so you're so right, Julia. Um, it was such a different experience, and you know, obviously, getting to work with it, uh, work on this, you know, with you in that in this in this particular context was uh, was something for us to figure this out together. But um, uh, specifically, I guess, uh, in the short answer would be this: um, I knew, having been a teacher, again, like referring to this idea of like students of so many different abilities, reading levels, etc that what matters most for young readers is um, to be to create visual images, right? So to use, you know, whether in traditional writing, 
utilizing figurative language, utilizing imagery, you know, sensory images constantly throughout, giving students or readers the ability to sort of see or to feel or to hear beyond the mere written word. But all of that is through description, right? And another tool to that is dialogue. You know, that helps sort of break things up and sort of contribute to a fuller picture of individual moments and scenes in a book. So when I was writing The Yellow Star House, that was the be all end all to me, was figuring out how I could do my best to create imagery so that readers could hopefully approach this sometimes difficult content in ways that they could see it too, that they could imagine being there because hopefully I did a good enough job or certainly tried to um, so that they could see what I was writing, what Robert was experiencing. This situation, the graphic novel, I mean, we had Sean. Of course, we didn't know it at the time we wrote it, but it was so cool, weird, challenging to sort of say, okay, I'm gonna write dialogue bubbles and then maybe text boxes to describe narration, but what needs to be shown? So in other words, you're not writing what is gonna be shown, you are going to have pictures that are gonna show what you're anticipating. Mm -hmm. So we would create, Julia, you found them, that amazing program that sort of was a graphic novel primer in terms of text box, bubbles, and then kind of like a play, right? Um, uh, directions, okay. essentially, or our ideas. We would put in links, we would put in what we saw. But I recall, Julia, and maybe you could elaborate on that part too, is that neither of us are, are artists. <laughs> and no. so we could see certain things the way we knew it based on historical context, knowledge, Steve's story, etc. But we definitely were going to defer to an expert, an artist like Sean, to be able to help round out things and give life to things that maybe we couldn't see because of our own artistic limitations. Exactly. I mean, goodness knows nobody wants to see the stick figure things that I would attempt to depict any of this. And so it really kind of came down to, um, you know, how how can we with our words, which is like our skill set, um, depict kind of art direction, if you will, and um, and and try to tell Sean how to show uh, the scenes. And I mean, we couldn't be more pleased with how our process went with Sean and how collaborative we could be um, going back and forth with ideas. And, you know, there were times too when um, just first time ever trying to write a graphic novel like this, maybe we wrote a piece of dialogue and then when we saw it on the page um, of artwork, we thought, wait a second, that just doesn't fit, you know, like in the scheme of the art, it didn't work so well. So um, just part of the process, lots and lots of editing. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> And Paul, can you hold up your review copy so our audience knows that we're not <laughs> making this up? This is a, a real, actual thing. <laughs> yep. um, thank you. Pretty awesome. Yeah, there it is. So yeah, coming coming to your home in the next couple of weeks, we hope, if you pre-ordered. Um, now let's go a little further into you know the chronology of Steve's story, his experience. The Kinder Transport Journey, um, really kind of the crux of his, um, or the beginning of his childhood trauma, perhaps. Um, we're gonna watch a short video clip of Steve talking about this Kinder Transport Journey. I was um, eight and a half years old when my uh my mother and father put me on a train to Hamburg and then on a ship to London. The British let 10,000 Jewish children come into England. Uh, most of them were orphaned effectively when they left because they never saw their parents again. I was selected, my brother wasn't, uh, and I was the one that went on that train, although he eventually got out also. I was one of the lucky ones. My father and mother both managed to get into England, uh, but for most of the others, that wasn't the case. 
So we see here on um, page 16 of the book, which is six panels viewing Steve and his mother um, about, he's about to board the big ship from Hamburg to Southampton. Um, he's got his numbered tag around his neck, one suitcase. Um, so an imagined representation of um, what this might have looked like and the tears with both of them. Um, Barbara, I, I wanna ask you, what do you know about how your grandparents and your uncle maybe grappled with Steve's departure? And you mentioned that your grandparents didn't talk about the Holocaust. Uh, did your uncle talk about his experience? Cause he was not chosen for a kinder transport. No, he was not. The, there was an organization within the Third Reich established by the Nazi government that was tasked with choosing the children um, who were to go. Um, it was, as far as we know, very random. Um, my uncle Ralph, then Rolf, uh, was, I guess, three years older than my dad. Uh, he was not chosen, but their cousin, interestingly, Ruth, who was 16, was chosen for a transport. So we really don't know much about that. And sadly, like my grandparents, um, my uncle didn't want to discuss his experience. Uh, he would have been 11 or so, and it must have been terrifying. He didn't know, or maybe he did know, why his brother had left the country, why his dad had left the country. Um, and it must have been a very scary time for my grandmother, um, who was an extraordinarily strong and capable woman. Um, but again, I don't know the impact on um, my uncle long term. He, he just didn't share that. Um, but we, we have my dad's recollections, um, largely through a, a writing class that he took uh, uh, through Temple B'nai Torah. And this is my shout out to both Temple B'nai Torah and Marilyn Layton, who was his writing instructor for 20 years almost. Um, and when you, Julia, and Paul had questions, I went back into these memoirs he had written. Um, and I didn't really know about the chocolate covered bananas until I went back and looked at his years of writing. Um, and those, those papers were so filled with details um, that I was just thrilled to find those um, because he really, he, as he got more into teaching, he also unlocked more and more of his past. And so now we have it to share going forward. And that's just a treasure. And I'm Absolutely. so grateful to you. Well, and, you know, I love that you and Steve wrote a book together. And so he, he was a writer he was. in his own right, for sure. He was. He was. He loved to write. I found after he passed away, um, he and his brother had written a play um, in which they called, they starred, they directed. My mother, I think, had the one female role and her brother mm -hmm. was the usher and ticket taker. So, <laughs> writing from an early age. So moving ahead a bit, Steve, he arrives in England and he spent just over 18 months there, um, which is not long, but they were some formative months for sure. So we do spend a fair bit of time in this book depicting his time in England um, after the kinder transport. Um, so I am hoping that Barbara, um, can you share the story about what happened to Steve when he arrived in London? Yes, I, I can. Um, so my dad arrived um, in a, a large reception hall with a train full of children who had just come across the English Channel. He knew how to say, my name is Stefan, where is the WC? Um, and all of the children in the transport were met by families, friends, uh, 
foster parents until there were only two children who remained, my dad and an older boy, I think he was 14 or so, uh, Pavel from Czechoslovakia. And eventually uh, somebody came over to them and with the help of an interpreter, um, helped them get into the car of a chauffeur who had driven up. Um, and it was explained to them that they were going to go live um, in Hampstead Heath, which is a very nice part of London. Uh, and it turned out that his great uncle Ludwig had been held up in traffic. And of course, we all know, you know, Seattle and Atlanta and all, all other major cities in 2021. And the idea of them, they were still using horses, of course, in 1939. But it was a very traumatic experience for my dad and I'm sure Pavel. Here he was in a strange country and he had no one to greet him. Um, and for the rest of his life, uh, for my dad, I showed up early, if not on time, um, because that experience of waiting and waiting and having no one coming was very significant to him. Um, Children suffer much greater uh, traumas, um, but it's important to recognize all of us, the traumas that children do face and when they are separated. And we see that today, children separated from their families um, in, in much, in, in as harrowing or more circumstances. I always wonder how it was for my grandmother to put her child on the train that was gonna take him to the boat into another country. Um, and we know today women are saying goodbye to their children and, and having them leave for their own safety. So, so many lessons um, from those years echo to me. Um, and I think that's why this book is so important um, and can really make this story live for new generations. Thanks, Barbara. Um, I don't know if we can bring that image back up, but I wanted to briefly describe what we were looking at um, in that page was um, Uncle Ludwig, who Barbara mentioned was late to meet Steve. Um, he finally makes it to the, to the group home and attempts to appease Steve with some chocolate, um, which is a true story um, that we wanted to represent and um, kind of, this book is meant for as young as sixth graders. And so adding these touches of humor, maybe of relatability is something that we, we did kind of prioritize. Um, okay, now, Paul, um, let's talk a little bit about historical context um, because not too long after Steve was in London, um, he left again to go somewhere else. Um, what happened? then. Sure, Julia, thanks. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I was thinking about it when I knew I was going to explain this brief part here that, <clears throat> that it's strange that the British had developed this, you know, program, the kinder transport, right, with, you know, children only coming away from, uh, from Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia to come to England, only children, not their parents. And then sure enough, September 1, 1939, uh, you know, uh, the invasion of Poland and uh, immediately England goes into war is coming mode. In fact, they declared war, I think, just two days later. And um, immediately uh, they began preparing to evacuate again all of their children, <laughs> um, children from London in particular, because they feared um, uh, the ensuing bombing that they anticipated coming. And so there was a huge mass evacuation of over 1.5 million children uh, and also included among the children were uh, women with infant, mothers with infants and also infirm people from generally London and uh, towns nearby out into the countryside. And that what the countryside meant was it could be as far as Wales or in Steve's case where he wound up going was to a small place called Abbott's Langley, which was only, uh, I think, about 20 miles away or so, which was a shocker to Steve, as is indicated um, in the book as well, right? That it was only 20 miles away, he learns as an adult, but as a kid, it seemed like a million miles away from London. 
So he goes and he stays in Abbott's Langley for uh, several months before ultimately uh, going moving again to a small village uh, where he was staying in a Quaker group home in High Wycombe. And uh, there he got to finally reunite with Rolf, his brother. And uh, not too long afterwards, uh, he and Rolf were reunited first with uh, their mother and then with their father, both of whom had been in an in internment camp as enemy aliens on the Isle of Man. So hopefully that sort of rounds out that part of the story before they're all reunited and get back to London and then the ultimate journey to America. There's so many layers here. I mean, I could talk at length about what we researched in Abbots Langley, the local historical society that we reached out to, um, the significance of the Isle of Man, and you know the fact that uh, German Jews, Alfred and Ilsa, were interned by the British government. Um, I mean, there's no end of discussion, but in the interest of time, um, I would love if we can watch the time lapse of Sean's art process for page 26. Um, and Sean, uh, you can talk to us about um, what you depicted here and, and how, how that came about, your, your artwork process. Yeah, thank you again. Um, and you know, the getting the pages from, from you and Paul were very richly described and, and there was a lot of detail and historical context, it was great. Um, and so I dive into these, you know, in this one, we're seeing a scene of all these children uh, marching. And again, like I said, I have, I have children myself. So I know there'd be a certain amount of chaos to this. And so we have this mob of children and some chaperones trying to keep everyone in line. Um, as I was drawing this, uh, you know, I was also learning about those, the crossing pole you see there that, that was common at the time. And um, halfway through this drawing, you'll see, uh, I realized that I was drawing the cars on the wrong side of the road. Uh, so I flipped it there. Um, so little, little things like that, uh, as well as again paying attention to to dress and uh, researching a little bit about uh, the boxes they're carrying. So Steve described um, that everyone was carrying a box with a gas mask in it, um, and I actually uh, put a gas mask on the face of one of the kids in the background. Um, again, kind of goofing off because it's a group of kids together. Uh, although you can see uh, on Steve's face a little bit more worry, uh, this being his second big evacuation. Um, you know, for the kids in London, they probably didn't have the same sense of reality uh, as somebody who had been uh, ushered from Germany across uh, without his family that Steve and Pavel would have had. Um, but these are still kids. So, you know, I wanted to capture that <laughs> chaos that would be this scene. Um, and yeah, that's that's what we got here. Thanks, Sean. And Steve is typically shown in the book with a green sweater, correct? Correct, yeah. Almost always. <laughs> um, okay, so I think we're gonna jump to um, a little bit longer video clip and we're gonna see Steve in action as a speaker, um, which will kind of lend some context for um, one more um, component of the book structure we'll discuss. At the museum, I learned about children who were separated from their families. And I thought, that's my story. That's me. I'm Steve Adler. I'm one of the 10,000 children that got out of Germany. I really wanted to meet Mr. Adler. Then he came to the World School. I'm a survivor. I come from another country, and of course, I, I had a different name. How many of you here are immigrants? Let's see your hands. How, ma how many of you are from this country? Nobody. Nobody. I was eight when I came to America without my mom or my family. Now I'm on my own. So when you talk about your country, what's your country? I still tell people I'm from Sudan. When I was young, there was a war in my country. So everybody fled. At that time I was in my mom's stomach and we, they walk for like 
10 days to Ethiopia, no food, no water. The war was really bad. We moved to a new country and it was just a new beginning. Many of the things sound familiar. Yeah, because it's the same situ situation. When you're young, you don't know anything. I seen the Holocaust picture of Steve. I was like, that's just a little boy. Why is he there? The image that I had in my head and the story that you were telling me, they all just went together. If you see somebody next to you and they're struggling, you just help them with one thing, that's changing the world. My life is difficult right now, but I want to make it better. It'll be better. I'm just going to be there to show the kids. You can go through hard times, but you can also get through them, you know? Mm -hmm. That's the main thing I can do. That's why I do this. It's very important to me. And one day, not, not too long from now, there will be a new person standing up here. It'll be you. All right. Mm, that that video is sort of iconic for us staff at the center, and just oh man, every time it's it gets me a little bit. Um, but as you can tell, you know, the mission of sharing his own story was so very important to Steve. We wanted to kind of make that the frame or the context of the book itself. Um, so Paul, are you willing to share about the structure and um, Steve's narration of the story a little bit while we take a look at um, page one on the screen? Sure. Um... Yeah, it's it's always hard to speak, isn't it? After that last <laughs> video clip, it just is always kind of, um, you know, goosebump inducing, often tear inducing. I mean, it just sort of sends shivers about why we do this uh, and what was so important about this story and what's so important about this education. Um, in short, you know, it, it's funny. I mean, you know, Julia, working with you was uh, such a seamless, incredible uh, uh experience really and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna miss it I guess now that we're actually done it's sort of weird but it's sort of hard to remember you know it feels like we were so vested in this it's hard to remember who had ideas for what anymore because <laughs> it just seemed to be such interplay and different like ideas and sharing and just so many things went back and forth but one thing that came so intuitively was how this story should be told and the short answer to that is that of course, I mean, Steve's passion was conveying this story. As Barbara mentioned earlier, educate, inspire, take action, the Holocaust Center's mantra. Education was so important to him and conveying these lessons of the dangers of where hatred can and does lead to students, to young people. And so casting this sort of as a story where it begins with him as the narrator, right in, in panel one, as you see on page one, um, so at that point, then, generally speaking, the text boxes in every single panel uh, throughout this, uh, this book are Steve talking as an adult, reflecting back on those experiences. So, um, and at the very end, then, it's kind of bookended, where we end ultimately with a reference to that scene that we all just saw in the video um, with the, the interplay with the young student, Nyan. Uh, and then in addition to that, then, you know, Barbara, um, Steve's daughter, his legacy sort of continues through Barbara's testimony and now through this book. So it really made really nice bookends and it sort of, it, it made an easy narrator um, for our story because 
why in the world would you, me, or a omniscient third person narrator come in when we had Steve, the greatest gift we could possibly imagine? Absolutely. Um, and again, staying on this page where we see, uh, well, we see Steve in a pink shirt, just like in the video, in a classroom that we kind of imagine to be the world school, the same school as in the video. Um, the second panel does have sort of a representation of a real uh, historic photo um, from Steve's family. So I'm hoping that Sean, you can share kind of how you represented some of these materials, you know, the primary sources or other things into your artwork. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're so fortunate that through all of that, Steve was still able to, to come to this country with so many pictures of his family. Um, and it's not, it's not a lot, but he has some really amazing uh, photographs of his family, of him and his brother. Um, just all of these uh, artifacts that are really priceless. Um, so for the, for the pictures, like the photograph that he's holding in the second panel, um, as to kind of launch uh, into his story, is uh, I tried to be as true to those pictures as possible. Um, so you know, you'll know you notice in a, a, another picture later in the book, uh, Steve is wearing some clothes that seem very unfamiliar uh, to modern day, uh, maybe American audiences. Uh, but I wanted to, as much as possible, capture what was in the picture, or at least the feeling of what was in the picture. Um, so there where he's talking about um, you know, generations of his family being from Berlin, uh, I thought it was such an important picture to capture. Uh, and, and throughout the book, you'll see uh, different historical photos uh, represented somewhat differently. Um, so there's a few pictures uh, later on in the book about uh, Kristallnacht, um, about broken windows and shops being burned. Um, they're captured stylistically a little bit differently. Um, and each of those, I, th I think, represents as much the imagery as well as the feeling that Steve's describing. Um, and of course, all of that from the perspective of a uh, little boy, so. Thanks, Sean. Um, let's take a look at the last couple of pages of the book um, as we see the end of the bookends, as it were. Um, more images that kind of represent um, actual events that Steve experienced later in life. And we also see Barbara. Um, and so I wanna pose the very last question to Barbara before we get to some um, audience questions. But, and you touched on this Barbara, but how, how do you see Steve's story relevant to us today? Um, and how do you take that sentiment into your own presentations as you're carrying on this legacy? Um, it, it's a great question. And, and if I haven't said so before, it's also an enormous honor and I wanna thank you and Paul and everyone at the Holocaust Center <clears throat> and Sean uh, and my dad, I love him peeking over your shoulder there in your little <laughs> thumbnail on our webinar. Um, it, it was really my father's legacy and I, it's so important today. Um, he was an activist for social justice. And he, you know, one person's injury is everyone's injury. I think he really believed that. Um, and today we have other people in the world who are, be, I mean, there's an enormous rise in anti-Semitism, but we have all other people who are being oppressed and endangered. Um, and he would, if he were able, if he were here, he would be doing what he could to combat that. So I just see this as my effort to leave the world a better place for his great grandson um, and for my children. Um, and I'm so excited at the connections that I see kids making um, and the interest that I see them showing in this story. Um, so it's, it's very exciting to me um, and to have this as an educational tool going forward. It's really, it's amazing. Well, thanks again to um, all three of you. We've got a few 
questions coming in um, that I'd love to get to in our remaining time. Um, we have something from Martin, and this might be well addressed by Sean or Paul. Um, he says, to me, the standard novel is to the graphic novel almost as radio is to television. In each case, the latter, so graphic novel or TV, has certain advantages but limits the visual imagination. Comments? Do either of you, any of you want to take a stab at that one? Sean, why don't you go since you're the artist? Sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think there is a a gift in in reading um, descriptive writing where you can imagine the characters for yourself. Uh, but because this is a historic piece, I also think that there's a, a real value to to showing um, the apartments and the the buses and the streetcars. And I think, uh, especially for younger readers, uh, this really puts them in a world that they may never have seen before. Uh, so I think it has a, a real potential for an educational advantage to be able to show exactly or my interpretation, our interpretation of, of what that was. Um, and then they can really focus on the story and the messaging, which is, of course, the most important part is Steve's story and his overall message. Thanks, Sean. Uh, another question for, for you, actually, if you don't mind. Um, Mark is asking, were the sketch drawings completed with color in the computer? Amazing work. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, actually, for a, a few of the sketches um, I did on paper and then transferred to a computer. Um, but for the most part, I, I drew uh, directly into a program on the computer and colored um, all locally within that program. So I used uh, Clip Studio for that. Um, it's there's a section of that program that's it's really well designed for comics and graphic novels, uh, and so I, I was able to use that and do, I'd say, ninety percent of the book directly onto the computer. Um, thank you. We have a question about from Marcy. Um, she says, "I know you all just finished this amazing project." But is there any speculation about someday translating the book to other languages? Spanish and German immediately jumped to mind. Wow. Um, uh, sure, if some if someone out there wants to help us take that on, let's go. <laughs> um, okay, this is actually, wow, this is kind of a big question for Barbara from Maryland, um, if you're willing to maybe give us a, a glimpse. Um, she's asking, Barbara, what was your childhood like? Oh my gosh. <laughs> that was everything. Um, that's just like in six, uh, 60 seconds or less. <laughs> I think that I had a very, very uh, blessed childhood. I have an older sister. We grew up in Connecticut. Um, my dad came to America um, and he had, he was quite bright. He got a good education and we had a, you know, a home and, and cats. And um, and I think because he, in the 1980s, you know, he wasn't maybe what, 45, he really began to grapple with his experience. So I don't think, and I guess my sister could speak to this, that we suffered. I know people whose parents were in death camps and, and labor camps. Um, it's very important to remember the timing of my dad's story. He escaped from Germany before the onset of World War II. And one of the blessings is that they were able to take away some things with them. Uh, things had not yet gotten to the point where they couldn't go. Um, and because of that, we were blessed, as Sean said, you know, with some sense of our family history um, and that's, so that's been very sustaining. Um, did I answer your question? <laughs> I think that was a great attempt. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, a lot of, a lot of great comments and thank yous, um, coming in, which we greatly appreciate. Um, oh, uh, Herschel, is asking um, Paul, what grade levels is the writing in the novel targeted for? Um, yeah, I think um, 
I can see it easily uh, being from grades six and up. Um, I think it's possible certainly to go beneath that um, if somebody really wanted to, if they you know had sufficient context and things. But again, teachers know who their students are. You know the communities and things. But as far as what we recommend, it starts at grades six and up. And um, yeah, absolutely. Um, from wearing, you know, putting my teaching hat back on again, I could easily see this being an incredible tool for teachers in a way that engages uh, all of their students really from top to bottom, bottom to top, um, in a way to, in not too long of a time even, to engage them and teach them the lessons of the Holocaust. I think it's a great safe entry point um, and really informative as well. So it really um, adheres to the guidelines for teaching about the Holocaust that we recommend. Thanks for that question, Herschel, hello. Yeah. Julia, do you mind if I hop in really quick? Please do, please do. So uh, in my house, I have a, a sixth grader and a third grader, uh, and the sixth grader has been one of my, my editors on the inside, um, and the third grader has been reading along with her, and it's, it's prompted some really interesting discussions in our house around the dinner table. Um, and so I'd say for the sixth grader, it's very accessible, really uh, valuable for her to have read. Um, and then what she shares with her younger siblings has also been fantastic. And I think uh, third grade even, uh, gets a lot out of this so absolutely well thanks for that um endorsement sean and your own kids um testing guinea pig style of of what we've been working on um well it is 12 58 and we're nearing the end of our program um so i want to close things out by um just thanking all of you so much barbara paul sean um this was a group effort and um, Paul and Sean, I mean, we couldn't have done this without each other. So um, thanks, thanks just endlessly. Um, thank you attendees for joining us for this Lunch and Learn launch of More Than Any Child Should Know, a kinder transport story of the Holocaust. Um, Steve, we miss you and think of you often. May your memory be a blessing. A reminder to all that the views and opinions represented in this program are those of the panelists and not necessarily of the Holocaust Center. Don't forget that our next Lunch and Learn is next Tuesday at noon on Zoom, featuring author Judy Battalion on women resistance fighters during the Holocaust. Hope to see you again. And before we sign off for good, we wanted to share Steve Adler's piece of advice for young people today, which was filmed in late 2018. So Steve, here's my question for you. What advice do you have for young people today? I would say, um, uh, respect people who are different because almost everyone is different from you. And when <coughs> someone doesn't show that respect by saying something negative defend the person who is being attacked mm -hmm. that's bullying and we, we need to do away with it i think that does the job so lovely Thank you all, and we'll see you next week. This concludes today's program.